Welcome to our presentation using the metadata to build a better road. I'm going to first introduce our first speaker, Dean Tesca. He uh, graduated with an associate's degree in civil engineering. He's been employed at four engineering survey firms slash survey firms and two earthwork and heavy highway contractors. He has 31 years of experience in the construction and grading. He's reverse engineered over 50 3D models and is currently performing survey work on the State Highway 23 construction team. Thank you, Neil. And that was Neil Steika. He is a professional engineer at Kapoor. Uh, uh, graduated from Marquette University with a bachelor's degree. He was one of the first 400 people to obtain the Road Safety Professional Level 1 certification. And he has worked on projects ranging in size and scope from bike paths to a heavily urbanized reconstruct in Milwaukee to working on the zoo interchange design team. And he also helped create uh, the AMG model. Examples and uses in survey and construction. I'd like to say before getting too deep in the topic that as a surveyor working in construction, I find myself in the engineer's shoes quite a bit trying to capture his or her intent. Luckily, if it is not clear, I can ask. We hope to offer you a different perspective today for your consideration, perspective of the surveyor, the inspector, the contractor, and how they are using your design data to build better roads. We will offer some tips from our experiences and also hope to ignite the conversation of working towards 3D deliverables as contract documents one day. So the way that I view this data uh, is types of metadata. Uh, you, these should be familiar to all of you. Surfaces, alignments, 2D and 3D lines. And we wanna use all this stuff in our equipment out in the field. Uh, these file types generally will come as XMLs, DWGs, or DXF files. And the surface classifications that we see are, you know, existing ground, uh, the proposed subgrade, otherwise referred to as the datum surface uh, on the top, uh, et cetera. All of this data could potentially be used in rovers and machines to build the job. So here I just have an example of a metadata packet from days of old uh, when inroads was in play. Um, and you can see the format on the left here of each of the file structures. Uh, and if I open that PDF, uh, it gives me a summary of what is in each file in each file folder and the name and the name of the surface or data, uh, which is really great to, when you're trying to find a specific thing. Uh, on the right is the DGN folder that I used to get. And this is how I learned to start going through the metadata uh, is we would just start importing one file at a time to see what it contained. Uh, it didn't take long to figure out that the PW was proposed work, SS was storm sewer, PD were paving details and et cetera. Uh, so we could bring in each separate entity and delete it back out of our drawing or do what we needed with it. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, you can see in this scenario, I have the structures reference drawing, uh, removals, uh, proposed storm sewer and a pond, along with some paving grades and paving details. So that's all pretty valuable stuff that I would have pulled into my drawing. Here's a, just an example alignment. I'm sure all of you folks have seen this before. Um, this is actually pulled into our software called Trimble Business Center, uh, which is like a utility software that can do quite a lot of different things. Uh, here I can actually edit the horizontal and the vertical features. I can check the station equations, match the plan, and I can key in super elevation data if I was gonna start building anything or revising anything. I can also generate reports very easily. Uh, and my favorite part about an XML file is that it carries all the decimal places uh, so that the rounding 
uh, doesn't change the stationing. But here you can see I can check PCs, PTs, I can check the stationing and the coordinates, I can check the arc length and tangent, delta and radius, uh, and the incoming azimuths and distance of each segment that is straight. Uh, down below, we have the profile report, which is giving us the station and the elevation of the PVIs. Uh, it uses the approach and departure grades and the vertical curve length, just like most design software. And in our profile view, it will actually show us the K value uh, that we can check against the plan of profile in the plan set. Uh, here's an example of some surfaces. Um, here in this case, it's an existing and a design. Uh, and then I have a plan view and a 3D view shown on the screen. It can be triangle mesh. You can shade it as a solid fill. You can shade it by elevation change. Uh, all these different tools we have allow us to look at the data differently, twist it around in 3D. Uh, we can check for triangle bus by vertically exaggerating the surface. If you notice down here, uh, I vertically exaggerated it to a factor of 11. Uh, so it's really drastic. Uh, and anything that could be off by a foot or half a foot will clearly jump out at me in the shading of the surface. You can also see here that the exterior boundary of this design appears to also be the slope intercept, which is handy. Um, and that 3D polyline is really useful to have in the field because uh, we can walk that perimeter and make sure that the slope intercept jives with existing ground uh, that was used to design it. We can easily use this boundary and these two surfaces to verify the earthwork for that section in the miscellaneous quantity table as well. Uh, so it does help us confirm uh, that the quantities are, are, are on, on pace. Uh, original and existing data. Uh, this is sometimes reference data or base data, I think you guys call it. Uh, a lot of that 2D line work is really valuable to us as inspectors and surveyors and contractors because existing utility lines, for instance, it takes a few seconds to take that file and make a DXF file that I can look at in my collector. Uh, if we're excavating for marsh and we come across a power line and they didn't hit it and nobody knows where it came from and there's no diggers flags, uh, we can easily toggle that DXF map on and see if it's a line that was part of the existing utilities. We can then go check to see if it was planned to be abandoned or who owns it, and we can call the facility owner to see if it's been abandoned. Uh, edges of existing pavement, uh, wetlands, existing culverts, all this stuff is really useful to have. Uh, and then also existing surfaces. We, we load that surface in our collector and we can walk around and stake out to it and it will give us a vertical discrepancy uh, and anything worse than four tenths, we have to report to the engineer. Um, so it, it helps us patch in, like maybe there was an area of grading that took place since the original topo, we can patch in a new surface and merge it over the top of what was used in the design uh, so we can get more accurate volumes on the job. Here's an example of uh, a lot of existing data pulled into the drawing. Uh, the removals, removing pavement, removing asphalt. Uh, I can see this hatching here is clearing and grubbing. Uh, and the green lines look to be uh, either brake lines or existing drainage. Uh, so that can be really useful in the field to help verify quantities. And if they're different from the plan, it helps us justify why. Uh, these curb lines down here by Midway Road, uh, we can go check to make sure that they are jiving with the base map. That also in turn helps us realize that our calibration is in fact matching what was used for the design. Uh, 
existing drainage routes are particularly useful when we need to stage where water is going to go until the new ditches and new storm sewer are in. Uh, so that's proved to be very useful uh, several times. Here's an example of how we are using some existing metadata in a complex manner. Uh, I got the proposed lighting. I got the existing utility file. Uh, my favorite part about that is uh, that OH line on the plan is so thin. Uh, but in reality, the, at the top of those poles, it could be 12 feet wide. Uh, so in this scenario, I modeled the proposed light pole by using the symbol and draping it on the surface, bringing it up one and a half foot per the construction detail and raising that up 30 feet and making a surface out of it and then kind of drawing the luminaire arm of the light pole. And we are able to shoot the existing power lines in the ground and the secondary power uh, with our survey equipment, uh, reflectorless technology. So we're able to measure the clearances to the proposed light pole uh, to make sure no one's going to get hurt when they stand the pole up. Uh, they concluded on this particular pole that they should lower it five feet uh, and the city was okay with that. Here's an example of some complex surfaces. Uh, actually, we can review using cross sections. Uh, we can see the cross slope of what was built versus what the design showed. Uh, we can see slope triangles are really faint and hard to see on here, but it kind of tells you which way the water goes based on the three vertices of that triangle. Um, and then in 3D view, as I said before, we can vertically exaggerate that and we can shade it by elevation. So if there's something that's jumping down to elevation zero, the shading will be off and we'll be able to rectify that. The priority digital data for us is the alignments and surfaces. Um, as I said before, the XML file carries all decimal places while keying them in from scratch will produce some rounding errors of a hundredth or two, which isn't earth shattering, but we always wanna be as accurate as we can. Uh, as a surveyor, I'm always trying to track the amount of error that I could be introducing into my work. So, um, but the, the entire job is displayed and built using stations and offsets. So these XML files of alignments roadways, crossovers, ponds, trails, no, retaining walls. Uh, they're so valuable and they also carry all their profile information with it. And we could key in additional profiles if we needed to. So I'll show that in a few other slides. And then surfaces, uh, XML exported surfaces for all strata. And the one thing I'd like to say about that is you know, they say land XML is the proprietary export that most files, most software packages can read. I have found that if you have vertical edges in your design, it considers that a stacked vertice and it doesn't know what to do when we import that land XML file. Uh, later, I'll get into how I hope to get the break lines for each of these surfaces so that I could rectify things easier because an XML file is just a cluster of data that I can't do anything with unless I have the parent data that created it. So sometimes if there's a vertical edge, the triangles will behave differently when I import it and it will might, like uh, right at the edge of the subgrade shoulder, it might take from the top of curb and jump out to the crown instead of coming down and then going to the crown. And I'll see that in my collector and I'll know that that's what it's doing, but uh, it's hard to fix the surface if I don't have the source data. Here's an example of a land XML file. If you open it up in Notepad or WordPad, uh, it will actually show you what you exported it out as in units. Uh, you can see the boundary name for the surface. You can see the actual surface name for that land XML file. I think if this had multiple surfaces in it, it would be naming them all for me uh, and all the boundaries uh, in as each cluster like this. So this is how we make sure that the exports were made in the project units.
Uh, here's uh, an example I was showing, talking about before, where we have an alignment with multiple profiles. So uh, this is in my Trimble Business Center software again. Uh, I actually geo-referenced the plan sheets uh, of the shop drawings from the contractor, showing where the back of straps are going to go. Uh, you can also see the proposed storm sewer in the background there. That's designer metadata. And then in the middle here, you can see under the vertical tab, I have multiple vertical profiles for this wall. As you commonly are aware of, there is a top of coping design and a finished grade design. And when I get the shop drawings, I will actually build in the level pad for their sand and their straps. So down in profile view, you actually can see all the slopes and the stations and see how all those grades are gonna jive and blend together. Uh, just for a quick cut check. Uh, when we're staking this alignment out in the field, we can be 10 feet off the horizontal alignment. And if we chose the level pad for vertical, it will still give us a good vertical cut or fill to that level pad or footing uh, wherever we're standing in relationship to that alignment if that's the vertical profile we stake out. Here's the example of the complex surfaces. Uh, this was one of the funnest scenarios I've been a part of where there was a proposed dry pond and we got contours and a surface for the finished grade. I have that shown in light blue uh, and then in red right below it is what we actually surveyed that they built but I had to actually build a bottom and top of clay liner for this surface because there was six inches of topsoil on top of it. And the purple line is representing rock excavation. So we had to resurvey existing ground because there were some differences. As you can see, the light blue is the design existing ground and the black is what we surveyed. And then we had to measure all the overburden to expose the rock and pay for that as common X. Then we had to pay for rock excavation down to the bottom of clay liner. And then the contractor decided that they were gonna use all this rock below for breaker run on the job and they over blasted the pond. So the DOT got a royalty for that material and we had to split all these quantities out for the staff. Uh, down here in 3D view, you can kind of see a lot of these surfaces are turned on and it's easier to look at them one at a time than it is to look at five at once, but I think you get the idea. You can see the rock excavation here at the bottom, uh, just on the south end of this pond. And that top of rock surface was surveyed. So we wait until they exposed it and then we scanned it with our total station. Another way we use metadata is for planning. So I can take the existing and the proposed and I can just run the volumes on the whole job and it will give me an ISO pack, which is a difference model. Uh, using the difference model, I can shade that based on what is cut and what is fill. Uh, and then I can print that out and we can hang that in our cubes for planning uh, to figure out where are the cuts, where are the fills. Uh, why is the contractor doing work a certain way uh, for the contractor? It helps them plan out where their cuts and fills and they can easily show their, their workers, you know, this is where the, the zero to 500 dirt is that we can do with the dozer. And this is where we're going to be hauling with scrapers where it's all fill. Helps with planning quite a bit. Here's an example of metadata pulled into my software that I use and I, I did uh, check all of the 2D lines that I was targeting uh, and I built a corridor for a couple purposes. Uh, this one is actually measuring the asphalt and the gravel for the trail uh, and from that shoulder point I cast it down a one-to-one -one and told it to tie to existing ground so we can actually calculate the structural fill needed for the trail. Uh, and that helps us determine how often we need to do testing.
Here's an example of our data collector with the designer surface loaded in the background and the designer edge of gravel shoulder, edge of pavement. You can see the reference line and the edge of concrete are running side by side there. And our subgrade shots on the checks are being done in plan view here. Um, when I take the shot, I will try to get as close to this linear triangle line as possible because that's the true shoulder point where we start jumping down to the ditch. Um, so I can see where the crown is. This helps me plan out where I'm taking my shots. There's also a few other tools I'll show in the next slides. I can actually stake out to that surface and it gives me a cut or fail down in the corner to, to grade. So I can see if they're within the tolerances. In this case, uh, I have a top and bottom of slope here right near the shoulder because we're doing subgrade improvement of 16 inches of select crushed. And that is where the subgrade improvement is supposed to stop is that edge of gravel. So we do have a top and bottom of slope there to shoot to accurately measure what they're doing. Here's that same example, but in a 3D view, we can see the surface shading where the ditches are. We can see where the curb and gutter. I can also vertically exaggerate this surface and it will show me spikes in the field that I might've missed when I was in the office. Uh, the shading of the surface, pretty incredible. It's showing me uh, 144 feet of vertical relief, which I can confirm in the plan. Um, and if this was had any entities at, layer, at elevation zero, uh, the blue end of this would be zero and this entire thing would look red. Uh, so this tells me that the surface doesn't have any spikes. The alignments can be loaded in this map with stationing shown, as you can see over here on the side road. If I were to have zoomed in on this main line, then it would be showing me the main line stationing. Subgrade shots are easily comparable to the surface and we can easily see where we have holes and we need to store more data. Here is another view we can get in the collector, which is cross-section view. Uh, in this particular example, I had keyed in a surface offset down of 1.33, and that is for the select crushed that I was just talking about. Uh, here you can see station offset, uh, and the vertical distance to that surface offset, which is showing that they are two and a half inches low here at the crown, uh, which we did have them fix in the field. Here's an example of the report that we get when we take those subgrade shots, uh, providing that we're using the design model or if we tweak it or if we recreate it, uh, it's still considered the design in my eyes, uh, and that is what we want to report to when we are checking the grade. So you can see I'm coding shots. I have station. I'm trying to take them at the 0 and the 12 and the 26, which is where the lane edges and the crown are. And then sometimes I'll go highlight the results for the inspectors so they can easily see how it's checking out. Uh, we are having a lot of GPS fluctuations on this job because of how hilly it is. Um, but typically it does float up and down up to a tenth, which is why they get that tolerance. I surveyed this as position on road, which means anywhere I walk, I'll get a cut or fill. Um, but if I actually were to key in station and offset and want to stake out to a specific station and offset, it would report the deltas of how far off I was. Uh, or if I was shooting the surveyor's hubs to make sure he's in compliance with his tolerances, uh, I could easily get those results as well. Uh, other useful design line work, not talking about existing data or the gold anymore, um, but I listed these six things. I mean, there's way more than six here, but kind of in the, prior, in the order of priority that I would like to have them, uh, the brake lines that make up the surfaces separated by name. 
as I said, if I have a XML surface, it's just a thing in my drawing. I can click on it and highlight it and see some details, but I can't modify it. So if I have all the break lines that made that up and the exterior boundary, I should really be able to highlight all that, generate a new surface and compare it against the original and it should match. Uh, and that way, if I need to change the slope or extend a super transition a little further, uh, I can break those 3D break lines, regenerate them using some corridor tools, and then recreate my XML model uh, that is perfect everywhere else other than where we wanted to change it. Uh, proposed edge of pavement, shoulder, gravel, curb and gutter, slope intercepts, proposed lighting. I'm rattling these things off and, and I'm sure you're all familiar with what they are, but the power of having them loaded in a rover and be able to select the line on your map and stake out to it is priceless. Uh, we're able to see conflicts uh, with utilities, conflicts with sign structures and overhead wires. Uh, all of these things help us avert disaster in the field uh, because the last thing you want is a $2,000 an hour crew uh, saying they have downtime because the design has a conflict. So proposed storm sewer, box culverts and bridges, and then supplemental things like marsh limits, wick drain boundaries, uh, pond contours. Those are all really useful. Uh, and the last thing is right of way lines. Uh, there are times where clearly there's a garage across the line or the contractor may decide that there's enough room between the right of way and the slope intercept to stockpile some topsoil. Um, we can easily tell ownership and if our surface is conf contained completely within our owned property. So I have some examples of this useful design line work. Uh, this one is kind of a cluster of many different types of data. Uh, but the right-of-way lines, uh, pond contours, I actually geo-referenced a plan sheet in here using the stationing of the roadways, uh, which I did check my alignments and profiles before I did that so I know I could trust them. Uh, but here I'm visually checking to make sure our pond is contained within our lot boundary. Uh, and this was owned by DOT, but this parcel next to it was not, so we had to look into that for the construction inspectors. Uh, and this is in fact owned by the village and they wanted to incorporate this existing drainage ditch into the pond. So we were able to check and confirm that that was part of the plan. Uh, I can see here that the right-of-way lines are matching up on the PDF really well. So that makes me feel good. And I could turn on the design surface and see how that's going to interact along this edge of pond. Uh, but that green line is a slope intercept. So uh, we figured out there was a little bit of scratch grading in between here that wasn't counted anywhere. Here's an example of some bridge metadata. Um, I know bridge guys always, they usually design in 2D, so we don't get a lot of 3D files, but if we did, it would be pretty great. Uh, we are able to load 3D IFC files into our collector and be able to select girders and different elements of the pier cap and footing and things like that for layout and checking. Uh, here you can see uh, this is where two bridges are coming together and these footings are separate on this pier. Uh, we will actually make text files with all the data. So we have that in our collector on the fly right from the plan. Uh, and we will compute all this bridge data from scratch typically because we wanna make sure that it's accurate but we will bring in the bridge metadata in the background and then highlight it all and then see how it overlays with our comps. Sometimes it will help us root out where maybe we made the wrong assumption. Other times it's pretty clear that the metadata wasn't up to date, uh, which isn't the end of the world because we almost prefer to compute our bridges from scratch. We can easily toggle any design line work such as storm sewer at the abutments to see how they're gonna interface with the abutment features. 
uh, existing utilities, et cetera, to see how they're going to impact pile driving and things like that. Here's an example of an as-built product that I made uh, on a job where we needed to measure all the concrete quantities and the colored concrete red and the sidewalk um, and the colored crosswalks. And by doing the exhibit in this fashion, instead of creating each item as its own entity, we were able to make sure there wasn't any overlap in the quantities. Uh, and we actually discovered that there was a huge reduction in concrete quantity. Uh, and, and when we started looking into why, uh, the concrete crosswalks were paid as a separate item at 12 inch depth. And the concrete pavement was being measured through that as well. So those crosswalks had to be pulled out and we actually had some contract savings because of it. Uh, and obviously I could have used the designer metadata line work to create this. Sometimes they just like to bring that plan sheet in and just show this is what was built according to what was designed uh, without it being hard to determine which lines are whose, you know? So that's why I did it this way. Uh, all your designer 2D and 3D line work can also quickly be exported to Google Earth. This helps with planning, organization for surveyors and con contractors and inspectors. Uh, we can email this to people and they can open it right up on their phone. Obviously you're gonna get a GPS signal that's plus or minus the five to 30 feet that you would get with a Garmin, uh, but it gives you the rough idea of what's going on and where you're standing and where the right of way line is roughly compared to the edge of the field or where the limits of work are in this mitigation site. Uh, you can get the idea. Uh, it helps us plan our control that we need for survey uh, geospatially. So it is not as accurate as a GPS rover, but it does help us paint the picture. Here I have an example of a 3D pipe network pulled into TBC. This is one of the most exciting things that I've seen recently. Uh, normally we are keying in station and offset and we just have a point or a 2D line on the screen. Uh, this is gonna revolutionize storm sewer and conflict detection in my opinion. Uh, you can see I can pick this storm line in purple here and on the left, it's telling me the from structure, the to structure, the inverts. I could see the pipe size and class, and I can see the slope and the length. Uh, so it's just very valuable to have. We can actually also load these 3D pipe networks in our data collector and have this exact same view. And the best part about it is it gives us a rim and an invert for each structure. Whereas before we would have to have two points, one for each uh, if they were both needed. And this slide is also just showing some basic 2D line work on 3D line work without any surfaces turned on. Uh, I have right away lines uh, proposed and existing. Uh, there's proposed storm sewer, and it also looks like there's existing culvert pipes turned on. Uh, you can see, I can select this line in blue. I can see that it's just an inlet, inlet, end wall scenario here. Um, and I can see the start and the end and the elevations. Uh, I can actually change this display from grid coordinates to station and offset out of any alignment in the plan. So if they reported the end wall off the side road, but the structure is off of main line, I can easily just toggle that and go check that stuff against the plan before I use it. But it does open the eyes to see that any one of these lines are selectable to lay them out in the field, uh, even if it's just to see if everything's gonna fit or how are we gonna stage this intersection over the winter. We obviously can't pour curb and gutter here while traffic is over here we're gonna to have to gap it and have a temporary asphalt plug here. So it, it helps us many, many ways. Uh, I, think, I think that's all I had. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Neil now.
Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Uh, Dean gave a lot of helpful for information from the survey and contractor perspective. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the basics from the FDM and what's required from the construction materials manual. What is the contractor data packet? It's the survey information, the design data files, other supporting documents for construction, like pipe networks and super elevation data, field control data, benchmarks, and survey markers are included in that, and the existing surface. Here's a table from the construction materials manual. It shows uh, what is required and who is responsible for the information and in what format for the design data files, uh, for the, which is the contractor data packet. It's primarily required to be in the digital format. Uh, there are some things that are in paper as well. And as you can see, almost everything comes from the design engineer. Uh, three things are from the contractor and one needs a registered land surveyor. What is a data packet used for? It's the metadata. Uh, it's to create an accurate construction model. It's, you can you use it to bridge the gap between the 2D plan and the 3D world. Verify earthwork and stages, making sure there's no gaps or overcounting of areas like Dean had talked about. It's the basic constructability check. Do things line up? Are these, are these are, are the, there areas that don't match into the existing ground? Do the stages shown in one part of the plan match the earthwork table? You can use it to check slopes and transitions prior to placement of pavement, curbs, sidewalks, walls. For example, verifying the grades and slopes in the paving grades match the cross sections. Also used to check the interface between two surfaces. Here's a table from the FDM chapter 19, dash, uh, section 10, table 43.4. It's a recommended electronic project data by project type. So as you can see, the, the amount of data varies depending on what type. So whether you're doing a bridge reconstruction or a resurface job or a full reconstruct and a major highway expansion, the amount of information you need. Uh, one thing that always remains constant is that you need the reference line data, that horizontal alignments that everything else is built off of. Here are some of the digital design data categories. Um, so you have the existing surface or, and proposed surfaces. You have the reference line data with profiles included. You have super elevation data. Um, you're gonna have a new in Civil 3D 2020, uh, you're required to export the point data for items like curb ramps. I think this should help uh, the contractors a lot instead of having to key in all those individual points. They'll be exporting an actual point file. Um, you need survey information, existing ground, the benchmarks, the field control data like we talked about. And then this is going to getting us all ready for the machine grading here so that they can do your use your proposed surface to do the grading. Um, some tips for the designer. Remove or rename old drawings and alignments. Rename drawings with something like void uh, to create a backup and eliminate confusion. We're going to want to remove redundant information. For example, maybe pavement marking uh, was done in one file but is no longer needed because it has its own separate file. We want to remove any culverts or other features that might have been started in the corridor file but are also located in another drawing. And remove extra copies of profiles so that only one is used, the one that is used in the corridor is left. Uh, quite often, it's easy to make a lot of vertical profile changes, make copies. If you're trying to hit different targets along the way, you make all these copies, but you don't end up deleting them. And what happens is by the time you're in construct, ready for construction, your model's almost done, you haven't updated the plan and profile sheet to match what you actually used in the model. Or um, somebody comes back later on and asks, oh, hey, which, which alignment did you use? Which, what's profile? And you can take the time to go back and figure out, okay, well, which profile did I actually use? Was that the correct one? Just a lot easier to, to remove those or at least rename them so that it's clear for everybody else that you no longer need that file. Going along with that, we're gonna to wanna to export the most current version of what we have. 
We, as designer, go through many design iterations to get to the final product. So be sure to have renamed or removed old versions and then export the one that is most current. This is especially important when it comes to surfaces and profiles. Um, include break lines and boundaries when exporting to Land XML. We want to clearly, so that we can get all of that data, like Dana is talking about, then he can take those individual break lines and use them to build a surface. If anything needs to be changed or tweaked minorly, or there's a spike, you can just remove that, that little spike instead of having to recreate everything. Um, and lastly, create a clear earthwork table to delineate earthwork tables by stage, roadway, and stationing. Here's an example of uh, a great earthwork table. You can see the from and to stations, very clear, a location, the stage. This um, really helps the contractor out to understand the design intent and would eliminates questions of how did the earthwork get calculated. Now I'd like to talk about a uh, case that ha happened on a project I was the design engineer for in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, during construction, we received an RFI regarding making the curb ramp uh, ADA compliant. Well, it was in our design, but what happened was we didn't have this joint where we saw cut surveyed and we were only had uh, shots at the back of building. And when they went to fit the curb ramp in in the field, it wasn't gonna work. So we had to make a retrofit to add a step in here in front of this building, which wasn't ideal. Luckily, we still had the sides here where we were able to build a ramp that was still ADA compliant. But situations like that can and do arise. So being sure to check the existing ground and asking this, this surveyor for um, hard shots to make sure that they get those shots done with, um, without the GPS so that they're more accurate. In addition, we discovered that a building was torn down after our initial survey. So we had to remove the driveway and change the grading behind the sidewalk. Uh, we did catch that during the design phase, but things can happen in the field between when you start design and by the time several years later, the design is finished. I'd like to talk about now some best practices for references. We want to keep them to a minimum, especially in design files. It's easier for the contractor to import them. It's less confusing where things came from. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to want to fix the broken references before packaging up the project. And we want to keep all the references within the project folder, not on your C drive so that 10 years later when you have the new computer and you no longer have those files, somebody else can't get them. Um, just keep them all inside that project folder. And when you wrap it up, you can submit everything and there's no questions about where things came from. We're going to tr transition to where we're heading. Um, we're definitely transitioning to a more complex design, curb ramps. Uh, stricter standards from the FDM require a finer level of detailed modeling and pipe networks where like Dean had talked about how excited he was to be able to get these. Well, designing them in 3D and being able to export that, uh, we can now see the designer's intent, help determine where interim drainage solutions are needed during construction. This is gonna be a big step forward. It does require more complex design, um, but it does provide a lot of value in the field. <clears throat> um, we also need to be more careful about ditch, barrier, curb, wall transitions to be included in the model with more detail. Here's a case where the design of the ramp terminal surfaces were not tied together. So you can see in here, they all overlap. Um, and in here, we have a gap. Now, this worked fine in the 2D world, plan world, where we could design this and edit our cross sections manually. Uh, for every 50 foot cross sections, we could okay, well, we're just gonna trim that surface here, we'll trim that one, it looks great. Um, now that we're transitioning to full 3D models, this is a common error, error that we catch, even if it's maybe not something as glaring as this, um, that kind of transitions need to be fixed. And it's gonna be those kinds of things that are limiting our ability to move towards a full 3D deliverable. We're inching our way towards that three full, D, full 3D deliverable. Contractors are already making the switch to doing more digitally. Exporting the data is a way to transition between the 2D contract documents, the plans, and the 3D construction-ready machine guidance model. 
uh, Wistot acknowledges in the FDM that nothing we have seen or heard leads us to believe intelligent design data transfer will get easier. In fact, we expect the opposite will happen. We expect that the degree of difficulty and the risk of error in intelligent design data transfer between different design software will grow as developers continue to add deeper and more complex functionality to their systems. So anything that we can do to eliminate errors in the design phase is going to make that transition to a full 3D model much easier. Uh, technologies like stringless paving and automated machine guidance are here and need a more refined model than just designing for cross sections every 50 feet. Dean, is there anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, thank you. On that same note, you know, we've come a long way, right? We, we used to put in hubs every 100 feet uh, for them to build the subgrade and everything that happened in between there wasn't in the plan. <laughs> and they had to use their eye and their, their level on their, their slope meter on their machine to grade it. So I can remember seeing a plan where common X and clearing and grubbing were listed on the cover. <laughs> um, now with 3D models, we're accounting for every square inch of the job. It makes it easier to build, to detect conflicts, to make sure we aren't overlapping surfaces and double paying for things as we've expressed. Um, and I got to thank you, Neil, for your comment about broken references, because that's always, <laughs> that's always a, oh no, they're referencing a drawing that I can't find, you know. Um, additional tips for designers, from my perspective, things that I've encountered, uh, feature lines, if they could be continuous without gaps or breaks or overlaps in the line. Uh, if it's one continuous edge of pavement from the beginning to the end of the job, that's great. I know with intersections, you can't always do that. Um, but if you could turn down that side road and then pick it back up, I, I know that's, it's by corridor, so it can't always be done. Uh, clean up old or bad CAD data or just put it on a layer that's called old or bad. So when we bring that DWG file in, we can just know that we shouldn't load that in a rover. Um, uh, when you put in a survey request for design topo, uh, please specify if you need hard shots. Uh, there's been a few times where I could tell that a design request was done with GPS. And then when we went to match into the paving grades, it was all up and down a 10th or two. And we had to go shoot it with the robotic total station and correct that and come up with new grades. The contractor is given a tenth of tolerance to build the subgrade because of the fluctuations in this GPS data. So as a designer, I just wanted you to understand that for good vertical, make sure you're specifying which equipment gets used. If you're tying into existing lane, we just want everything to work out. And that's all I have. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, everybody else. Um, if you have any questions, and well, when I answer the ones that we've received in the chat pod during this presentation and any other ones that come in, we'll take some time now to open up the questions. Thank you very much.